Hello, this is Poetic Wisdom. Tonight I have a selection of poems by Philip Larkin. The first is a poem for Sidney Bichette, an American jazz clarinetist and saxophonist. who lived from 1897 to 1959, born in New Orleans, where he spent his teenage years playing in the dance halls and brothels of Storyville. That note you hold, harrowing and rising, shakes like New Orleans reflected on the water, and in all ears appropriate falsehood wakes building for some legendary quarter of balconies, flower baskets and quadrilles, everyone making love and going shares. Oh, play that thing. Mute, glorious storyvilles. Others may license, grouping round their chairs, sporting house girls like circus tigers. Priced, far above rubies. Pretend, they're fads, while scholars Monks nod around unnoticed, wrapped up personnels like old plaids. On me, your voice falls as they say love should, like an enormous yes. My crescent city is where your speech alone is understood and greeted as the natural noise of good, scattering long haired grief and scored pity. The next poem is called Born Yesterday, and it says, it is for Sally um, Amos, who was a daughter of Larkin's friend, the English novelist Kingsley Amos and his wife Hilary. Here it is, born yesterday. Tightly folded bud, I have wished you something none of the others would. Not the usual stuff about being beautiful or running off a spring of innocence and love. They will all wish you that. And should it prove possible, well, you're a lucky girl. But if it shouldn't, then may you be ordinary. Have, like other women, an average of talents, not ugly, not good looking, nothing uncustomary to pull you off your balance. That unworkable itself stops all the rest from working. In fact, may you be dull if that is what a skilled, vigilant, flexible, unemphasized, enthralled catching of happiness is called. The next poem is called Church Going. Once I am sure there's nothing going on, I step inside, letting the door thud shut. Another church, matting, seats, and stone, and little books, sprawlings of flowers, cut for Sunday, brownish now, some brass and stuff. Up at the holy end, a small, neat organ and a tense, musty, unignorable silence. Brood God, brood God knows how long, hatless, I take off my cycle clips in awkward reverence, move forward, run my hand around the font from where I stand, the roof looks almost new, cleaned or restored, someone would know, I don't. Mounting the lectern, I peruse a few hectoring large-scale verses and pronounce, here endeth, much more loudly, loudly than I'd meant. The echoes snigger briefly back at the door. I sign the book, donate an Irish sixpence, reflect the place was not worth stopping for. Yet stop I did, in fact I often do, and always end much at a loss like this, wondering what to look for. Wondering, too, 
when churches fall completely out of use, what we shall turn them into, if we shall keep a few th cathedrals chronically on show, their parchment, plate, and picks in locked cases, and let the rest rent free to rain and sheep, shall we avoid them as unlucky places? Or after dark, will dubious women come to make their children touch a particular stone, pick simples for a cancer, or on some advised night see walking a dead one? Power of some sort or another will go on in games, in riddles, seemingly at random, but superstition, like belief, must die. And what remains when disbelief has gone? Grass, weedy pavement, brambles, buttress, sky. A shape less recognizable each week, a purpose more obscure. I wonder who will be the last, the very last, to seek this place for what it was. One of the crew. The tap and jot, and you know what rude lofts were. Some ruined bibber, randy for antique, or Christmas addict counting on a whiff of gown and bands and organ pipes and myrrh. Or will he be my representative, bored, uninformed, knowing the ghostly silt, dispersed yet tending to this cross of ground through suburb scrub because it held unsplit. So long and equably, what since is found only in separation, marriage and birth and death and thoughts of these for which was built this special shell. For though I have no idea what this accounted frosty barn is worth, it pleases me to stand in silence here. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies, and that much never can be obsolete, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it to its ground, which he once heard was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie round. So that was church going. The next is an Enrundel tomb. This is a 14th century table tomb of Richard Fitzlin III, 13th Earl of Arundel, and his wife, Eleanor, in Ch Chichester Cathedral, Sussex. Side by side, their faces blurred. The Earl and the Countess lie in stone, their proper habits vaguely shown. As jointed armor stiffened pleat, and that faint hint of absurd the little dogs under their feet. Such plainness of the pre-baroque hardly involves the eye until it meets his left hand gauntlet still clasped empty in the other and one sees with a sharp tender shock his hand withdrawn holding her hand. They would not think to lie so long such faithfulness in effigy it was just a detail friends would see a sculptor's sweet commission grace thrown off in helping to prolong the Latin names around the base. They would not guess how early in their supine stationary vo voyage the air would change to soundless damage, turn the old ten tenantry away, how soon succeeding eyes begin to look, not read, rigidly they persisted, linked, through length and breadth of time, snow fell, undated, light, each summer thronged the glass, a bright litter of bird calls strewed the same bone-riddled ground, and up the paths the endless altered people came, washing all their identity now helpless in the hollow of an unarmed unarmorial age, a trough of smoke and slow suspended skeins above the scrape of history. Only an attitude remains. 
time has transfigured them into untruth. The stone fidelity they hardly meant has come to be their final blazon, and to prove our almost instinct almost true. What will survive of us is love. Okay, and so the next poem I have for you by Philip Larkin is called 1914. And the title appears in Roman numerals for the dead of, on a memorial for the dead for World War I. Those long, uneven lines standing as patiently as if they were stretched outside the oval or villa park, the crowns of hats, the sun on mustached, archaic faces, grinning as if it were a holiday on August bank holiday lark. And the shut shops, bleached, established names on the sun blinds, the farthings and sovereigns, the dark clothed children at play, called after kings and queens, the tin advertisements for cocoa and twist, and the pubs wide open all day, and the countryside not caring, the place names all hazed over with flowering grasses and fields, shadowing doomsday lines under wheat's restless silence, the differently dressed servants with tiny rooms in huge houses, the dust behind limousines. Never such innocence, never before or since, has changed itself to pass without a word. The men leaving the gardens tidy, the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer. Never such innocence again. next poem is called Talking in Bed. Talking in bed ought to be the easiest. Lying together there goes back so far, an emblem of two people being honest. Yet more and more time passes silently. Outside, the wind's incomplete unrest builds and disperses clouds about the sky and dark towns heap up on the horizon. None of this cares for us. Nothing shows why. At this unique distance from isolation, it becomes more difficult to find words at once true and kind, or not untrue and not unkind. And I think I will read one more. This last one is called The Trees. The trees are coming into leaf like something of almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. Yet still the unresting castles thresh in full-grown thickness every May. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh, afresh, afresh. I hope you enjoyed this reading. And have a wonderful night.